begin with, we have with us Dr. Onika Mehrotra, ma'am, principal at Kalka Public School, self-directed, enthusiastic educator with a passionate commitment to student development and the learning experience. Skilled in the design of challenging, enriching, and innovative activities that address the diverse interest and need of students. She has been felicitated with many awards and accolades, to name a few, awarded D.Lit Doctorate by the University of South America, Dr. Radha Krishnan Award for the meritorious work in the field of education. I am into this field for the last 20-25 years almost now. Uh, started as teaching the primary level. Of course, my qualification, I also improved uh, while teaching. Like I had the psychology honors and I went on to do uh, MA in uh, political science and did my PhD. So it was, um, I, I was passionate about it. As a young child, I was asked, what is your aspiration? Whom would you like to become? And from came the reply that I'd like to become the Iron Lady Indira Gandhi ji. So that was the aspiration and then uh, into the field of education, still growing. We have school in Delhi, we have school in Faidabad, we have school in Meerut, we have a school in uh, Kuwait and the upcoming branch in Bahrain. Also, we have higher education, uh, dental college and other um, uh, courses for higher education and well I'm uh, totally engrossed in it, deeply involved into every aspect that I can help and groom my teachers. Okay. I consider them as my colleagues, my co-partners and I love to decentralize my work and take it forward. Moving forward, our next panelist is Ms. Nidhi Tiwari Ma'am, Principal at Ridge Valley School. She has tried to invest her best in being a leader in the field of education for more than two decades, that is 22 years and is going stronger. A senior faculty member leading the curriculum design using innovative teaching practices and pedagogical transformation in classroom and her work has empowered her as an educator. She has represented India internationally, nationally and conducted work workshops, talked in global forums in UK, Europe, Middle East. She has also been felicitated with many awards and accolades. To name a few, National Teachers Award by CBSE 2018-19, CV Raman Award for Exemplary Leadership, Best Coordinator Award 2019 by the Future Foundation and many more. And 22 years going strong. I'm a technology mm -hmm. enthusiast and I love to work and explore uh, and innovate in uh, in the field of technology, artificial intelligence, and the latest being the launch of the Meta with Facebook and CBSC. My school was represented in that Meta film that was launched. So I am on the CBSC Committee for Computer Science, Informatics Practices, and Artificial Intelligence as a subject expert. And uh, I am the principal of Ridge Valley School, which is a DLF Foundation school, a beautiful boutique school in the heart of Gurgaon. And uh, I have a lovely group of teachers whom I call my teammates. And together, it's a wonderful team. And uh, I love to be with my children. As I just said, you know, we are missing children. School without children is like a body without soul. There is no energy. There is no charm. So fond of my students, love to innovate and move ahead. And passion is to be a lifelong learner because one, when you are a lifelong learner, then only you update, upgrade and you innovate. Moving forward, we have with us Mr. Anand Kumar, sir. Vice Principal at Khitan Public School. He is a seasoned academician with more than 17 years of experience in the field of education. He has specialization in curriculum integration with various strands in school education. He designed the curriculum of social and emotional wellness for K-12 entrepreneurship and skill building program for school, global connect and citizenship program, etc. He has also presented his various research papers on the various academic related topics in NUEPA and Tata Institute of Social Sciences. He started his career as visiting faculty in MD University, Rohtak and currently associated with Khetan Public School. Uh, I belong to that community where we feel proud while serving our children and uh, taking care of them in advance. 
you can understand that today we are having you know a uh, vaccination drive it's a fourth vaccination drive and uh, we have to ensure that 100% vaccination has been done so we take care of our uh, students more than whatever we even know about our family member so this is one of the legacy i can say which all the educationist including uh, my co panelist share with each other so this is all about us this is our uh, charm and beauty of life now i'll be also introducing lian so she is the chief learning officer at zees uh, where she is responsible for the curriculum and teacher quality she has masters in neuroscience and a masters in education from stanford university she has worked in seven different mm-hmm. educational institutions across mm-hmm. four continents mm-hmm. among mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. innovative mm-hmm. african leadership academy in south mm-hmm. africa and the charter management organization and common schools in new york city i think that started Well, when I was in my teenage years, my father is a teacher. He, he teaches math, and I always loved that profession to just like get kids to learn new and interesting facts. Um, I studied biology and became a biology teacher for a bit, which I think is one of the most exciting subjects to teach, like the study of life. There's so much you can do in the classroom and really make it project-based and all mm. other buzzwords you can use can definitely be used in biology. It was it was amazing. but i also felt the impact was very limited as just teaching one or two classes is not that much and so i wanted i wanted to know more and i also wanted to know more of how can we actually make learning as effective as possible we only have a certain number of hours in a day and how can we make sure we spend those the way we want it and not just learning but also exploring and spe- spending time with our family so that's when i did my neuroscience master to learn more about how the brain works and how the brain learns um i've worked in uh education consulting afterwards so in uh, at EY Parthenon you might might know it it's a pretty famous education consultant did a lot of work in higher ed but also more commercial education um then i did my masters in education at Stanford University and that's where i met the founders of CC uh, Samia and Mehak and they were like you need to join our company we need someone who knows how to make uh a curriculum and that's what I've been doing in the last year or so we're making we, we have a we basically call it an english curriculum so we teach english to kids in small batches of uh, one teacher to five kids but it's a lot of personality development so we do a lot of social emotional learning we have modules on uh, habits of success like how do you study how do you regulate your emotions how do you have difficult conversations how do i think of what my future needs to look like all those things we expect kids to know but not every teacher knows how to teach or actually has the time to teach and so we're we're trying to help get kids those skills through also teaching them english um and that's that's going well we have about 10,000 students i think at the moment uh, from all over india um and an amazing group of very very innovative and positive teachers that are just doing online teaching um and it's always i always feel very humble speaking to them uh they know so much more than i do and it's it's amazing to see how they interact with our kids and uh every time when they a batch is over they're just happy and and sending screenshots and it's it's so rewarding to see so moving forward we have with us dr priya mathur ma'am who is the director at modern international school this is a story of a girl who started her career as an it professional in a renowned organization an organization which is a dream of many youngsters who work in ipm but as we surely say life is never simple she was working happily when her father had a paralytic attack and a brain stroke at the time when the registration admission of his dream school modern international school dwarka was opened this played a turning point in her life and she had to leave her job as a professional soccer and entered into the world of education which was new to her as she had to fulfill and achieve her father's dream it's been really exciting for me because uh, this was a complete new uh, area for me when i joined the school and uh, with the years that have passed by like i have 15 years experience now so every year has uh, given me a new knowledge and uh, every time i think of it i think of something new and with this new education policy definitely what all i have thought of because i was in believe of this thing that uh, 
the specialization stream should start from 9th standard because uh, two years is too less to get a specialized stream education so with the new education policy if it will be implemented properly then i think we can achieve a part of that uh, thing which so i'm truly looking forward for this uh, new education policy so oh, now we are having with us mrs anita sharma ma'am she is a principal of sg public school pitampura in new delhi member national focus group to prepare position paper in mathematics education general council member at ncert she has contributed in the field of mathematics education and has trained more than 1000 teachers and principals in india and overseas for her innovative experiments in the field of mathematics education she was given presidential grant to celebrate legacy of eminent mathematician shrinivas ramanujan for 3 years and a lifetime achievement award aryabhat samman by all india ramanujan mathematics club She is a passionate educationist and her mission is to prepare committed generation. She has authored many books on mathematics. Delhi government has appointed her as governing body member for committee established to achieve the SDG goal of universalization of elementary education. Uh, I think you know when you are in company of young children they always enthuse you and infuse you with the new energy. and so i feel that i am a lifelong learner and uh, i always uh, gets inspiration from my children and always feel to learn more and to experiment more and uh, this uh, uh, this attitude of experimenting and trying new things and uh, doing uh, innovative experiments in education probably um, has ended in this Uh, uh, what you are saying that uh, you have been associated to so many bodies <laughs> so it is all because of that that the changing needs of indian and international education standards is the prime reason for the indian government to revise their education policy and that too after 34 years so ma'am how has nep decoded indian education and is nep changing the face of it for the need of the hour it has come very late it has been uh, in the discussion for very very many many years but finally it has come because a lot of thinking had to go into it you just couldn't one one find and say okay here is the policy so a lot of thinking went into it comparisons were drawn a lot of principals and other educators were part of this uh, national education policy it was a need of the hour because previously we were having a lot of rote learning from rote learning to curiosity to imagination to critical thinking innovation all these aspects had to be a part and parcel of a teaching pattern which wasn't there when we used to travel abroad and see schools in finland or iceland or japan for that matter there were a lot of contrasts of what we were doing unfortunately we could not adapt those policies in our uh, culture or in our atmosphere because there were a lot of uh, hindrances but having said all said that i think let's not look backward let's make it progressive let's look forward and exciting things to look forward because ultimately what is all education all about it is child centric if you're not bothered about child's growth and holistic development then the purpose of education is defeated and hence is the need of the hour let's all gear up together with the uh, try to uh, you know cross all the hurdles and let make let's make it successful and that's how we'll be able to justify our education so i would say that this new education policy in two words is revolutionary and evolutionary revolutionary because it has come after 34 years and evolutionary because this is what is required nowadays and thanks to pandemic that we have all kind of you know transformed our teaching learning system we have transformed the pedagogies it 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 is it is the need of the hour as mrs mehrotra dr mehrotra said that we need to change the pedagogy we need to look relook at the learning systems in our classroom we need to have an education system which is more child centric which is more experiential blended and has the skill set so 
evolutionary because it has to develop a child into a four dimensional child and what is a four dimensional child which has length breadth depth and skill set so it is very important that we as educators uh, take on this new educational and start i mean we have already implemented it in a way if you look at the way our classroom transactions are going on the schools have already implemented the new education policy in terms of looking at the curriculum in terms of the pedagogies in terms of the project works in terms of assessment we all have started working on to it so i feel it is really a blessing for our students how do you think nep is ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education when we talk about the inclusiveness generally we think lobe sided and we feel that if we are addressing the needs of the special need children in the school that means we are inclusive in our approach but inclusiveness in true sense means that you should be able to address the needs of all members who are the part of the school uh, family so here this uh, i will say that this uh, this uh, new education policy is truly inclusive in the sense number 1 it is talking about uh, the needs of each and every type of children and it says that we will be uh, having the 100% gross enrollment ratio and every child has a right of not only the education but to the quality education and till the age of 18 years everybody should have the uh, right to the education so it is not to, uh, talking only up to the age of 14 years but uh, but up to the age of 18 years second thing it talks about the inclusiveness of every uh, uh, body in the system uh, uh, beyond the discrimination of the gender or the region or the religion or anything for the first time in the in this policy you know it it, it is not a, not talking talking only about the boys and girls it is uh also uh, the one word has been used here the transgender also so that means the policy is keeping its focus on each and every citizen of the country despite of his uh, 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 uh several other issues uh, 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 whether he is coming from a particular economic strata or from the particular gender or from particular religion uh, or region or, uh, or so on then uh, it has also uh, it is also talking about starting of several type of funds like there is special gender fund there is special provision for providing the even the um, bicycles to the girls uh, if they are staying in the remote areas and they have to travel to the schools uh, for long distances so they should not face any kind of security uh, issues on the way okay uh, then it is also talking about breaking the barriers uh, of the uh, breaking the boundaries of the subjects so it is focusing on the multidisciplinary uh, uh, education so that means uh, you will be getting the freedom to read every kind of to study every kind of subject without having any kind of uh, stigma in the mind that uh, i am the student of the science stream or the humanities or something so uh, the the choice is given so i think so many provisions has been made in this uh, policy to make it inclusive and equitable in the true sense this inclusivity and equality has been redefined uh, as ma'am has said the previous uh, uh, resource person that it's not only talking about the cwsn category or a child with a special need but it's also talk about all the children so it's it's not horizontally it's a vertically and horizontally both at each level of uh, the child's learning there is always a provision for the improvement and that's move toward competency based education this is one of the very very important thing so for me a child whosoever is standing and at at any sudden period of time or with any particular content or any particular knowledge the child has a space for the improvement and it's also talks about the 
uh, individual approach of child learning. I think this is the first time in India where we are talking about personalized learning in true sense. This is one of the very, very important thing for me as a uh, person in academics. Uh, in terms of even <clears throat> uh, inclusivity, there is certain things which they have also added. Not only they are talking about integration of the various subject or integration of various art of Vidha. Vidha is a Sanskrit term. But they also talk about within the subject, what kind of things can be interdependent and can be uh, express and talk to the uh, talk, uh, uh, engage the children, not teach the children, engage the children in a better way for their own learning. One more thing I would like to talk about uh, this approach in NEP, which is really, really very, very fascinating for all of us. This is the first time when we are talking about learning first, engagement of the students first, and the teacher's role as a facilitator. So in coming future, we'll also find that kind of thing in our, uh, in this particular periphery. In terms of equality, uh, equity, ex exact what they have used. So look, every child has to attain certain mastery at a certain age of time. Either a child from uh, uh, CWSN or the child with, uh, you know, regular classes. So what kind of minimum level of learning should be attained by the child that is also being carved in this particular uh, education policy and that's one of the very very important thing in terms of equity right they defined at each level what kind of learning outcome should be there right and apart from learning what kind of skill and disposition child has imbibed at this stage of time that is one of the very very important thing under the part of uh, inclusivity and equity that's very very important to me apart from so many other things these are the prime focus where this government has given us stress on that uh, and achieving these particular you know objective rest other things are the supporting factor uh, to uh, attain that particular you know objective NEP 2020 will take Indian education to the global standards as internationalism of higher education, which is the of utmost importance and it has also been a salient feature of NEP 2020, as said by the Union Education Minister of India. So what are your views on the international standards of higher education? It was also mentioned by Dr. Onika Ma'am. So what do you think that how can these things be achieved? One of the goals is to like increase internationalization, which I think we should see is in, in two ways. Like one is students coming to India and learn in one of the higher education institutions there, but also making it easier for Indians to go abroad and study elsewhere and then get their credits uh, approved by their university or other higher education institute at, at home. And it's interesting if you see that about a quarter million Indians study abroad every year, but it's only about 50,000 students that come to India to study. Um, and so there's definitely a gap there, which is true for a lot of countries, but, but still this is a huge gap, it's like 5x. And so to actually make that happen, to get more students into India, I think there's a few things uh, India itself can do. Um, and one of the examples I took is, is from Europe, like, to get their points like recognized by their own university and I think one of the things they did was make sure everyone was on the same structure so in Bologna they decided to all adopt the master's oh, sorry bachelor master PhD system which wasn't true before that like the Netherlands for instance had a very different system uh, than Germany and it was very difficult to go abroad so making that an international standard or at least adhering to what a lot of the world is doing is important um, of course, like I mentioned, getting recognized by international accreditation bodies can be very important. Like Europe has this Europe-wide accreditation body that, that accredits universities at a Europe level. Um, another thing is also just scholarships and visas and entry to the country. If that's difficult, students are often scared and, and won't try it. So the availability of, of some monetary help, but also easy access to visas like in Europe it's just you don't even need a visa um, it's easy to travel around and go study elsewhere 
and how that's done. I think a lot of countries that are starting with this, you, you can see this in the UAE as well. They usually tie up with a big name university that is like in the top hundred. So usually a US university that gets some sort of a small satellite university in that country to like increase status. Um, and another thing is always attracting PhD and professors that have that are leading in their fields to increase the uh, status of a university as well. Um, so it, it's, it's that is often interesting to me that quality education sometimes starts with PhD students and professors rather than the actual curriculum itself. It's just the people that are in your university can often help um, with that. And so I think India has a, a bunch of really good universities. Like I think across the world, the IITs are very well known, but it's of course only a few of the hundreds of institutions available. And so again, that quality recognized elsewhere um, could really lead to higher internationalization. National education policy, it highlights that in all stages, experiential learning will be adopted, including hands-on learning, art integrated, sports integrated education, etc. So what NEP has to say about experiential learning and why is it important? See, since childhood, even if we talk about our childhood, we have been studying things which we actually don't know how to implement in the real world. So. This is where we were lacking actually because uh, this is, was the main cause why the students were not getting interested in studying the stuff because they never knew that where it will be implemented in our real life. Though on, on if we see the actual basis of this, it will be like that whatever we have studied, we have actually knowingly or unknowingly implemented somewhere. But when we study that, we don't know. And when we don't know, we actually don't get interested in studying. So NEP, when we will have that knowledge while studying that, yes, whatever we are studying, the actual uh, working of this or this will be utilized in that particular area, it will interest more in, uh, students. And uh, the students will be more interested in knowing that uh, whatever they are learning, it will be useful for them, not just a book knowledge. So definitely experiential learning is the most important thing which was required from the past many years, but now it will be finally implemented and uh, it will change the way of studying and it will change the mindset of the students as well. So it will be very, very important. It is, it is actually a very important part of the education system. In earlier days, we used to have joint families. We used to have grandparents, grandmothers telling us stories. We could relate to them. Over the years, it all became nuclear families. Children were left on helpers or uh, computers or the internet to get the knowledge. So they were not, you know, able to relate to themselves. So it's very important while teaching, the children should explore what they're learning. Else, again, as I, I would say, it'll become rote learning. We don't want that to happen. We want children to experience that this is, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And the curiosity building allows them to experience that okay this is how we are going to do it and you can relate yourself else there's no coordination so we take them out to let's say nature walk they see stuff they relate themselves and they're able to come back to the classroom environment and do that so you have to collaborate that is why you know we have made thematic curriculums we have made the subject integrated with other subjects also we can't study in isolation nikita we need to interweave interwove ourselves to different subjects to ultimately get to the crux of the whole thing that is why internationally the, the children are given more liberty and more access you know to ask questions why where to walk here it was the teacher speaking. So from the teacher talking, now is the students exploring and giving us and giving the output. That's how the experiential learning takes place. So it's very important for teachers while teaching, uh, stop just reading from the curriculum, allow the child to have a little knowledge about the content and let him speak about it. And then in the peer group, share their experiences. You know, there are so yeah. many children in the classroom in India. Yeah. And the divide, the urban and rural divide, I wanted to bring this question up that the NEP is there, right? But this urban rural divide, that barriers has to be broken. Only then I think we can be very successful because NEP talks about the experiential learning uh, from road learning to critical learning to, you know, uh, creativity, fun loving, 
uh, and the ears are very well balanced for the child to be that uh, matured enough to understand what he's uh, the, you know studying so learning has to take place it's not just you come you teach and you go off to so learn to relearn and relearn again so that's how things have been brought up uh, the rural divide is vast and i just hope the internet facilities stuff like that we get more in abundance and the classroom structure will not change in india we'll still have 30 35 children in a class or 30 20 25 having said that the role of teacher to upskill them becomes important so that the the fun loving the the, the experience of going uh, to the process of understanding and exploring takes place what have been the major roadblocks to implementation of yeah. nep i know it's very simple and easy to talk but when it comes to implementation it is a actually a challenge and it requires a lot of planning you know india is a classroom and india as when i say india is a classroom it has uh, all kinds of students and uh, Uh, all kinds of school systems we have a boutique system we have a public school we have a government school uh, we have a teacher student ratio as 1 is to 20 and on the other side we also have a teacher student ratio as 1 is to 40 and 42 because uh, this is what it is so the challenges or the roadblocks is uh, like if you talk about today's scenario uh, during the pandemic the major roadblock was the um, digital digitalization or the gadgets or the internet or the uh, wifi availability to students like uh, most of us are teaching in private schools we know that our children were able to afford it but what about those 25% who are from the economically weaker section who don't have these gadgets or even if they have one gadgets and there are three children studying from the same mobile phone it was not feasible so that was one kind um, of a challenge then if you look at uh, a normal classroom scenario then uh, you know uh, the absenteeism the regularity that is one point which needs to be uh, monitored then the as we were discussing building the involvement of parents and teachers that's very important a connect what we say a home school partnership that's very important we can't work in isolation in our classrooms we need to have our parents on our side you know our parents have to be taken into confidence then the third most important thing which the nep also emphasizes and we just have discussed is the inclusive classroom the inclusion you know we need to practice we need to have inclusive classroom and an inclusive setup in all school it is a mandate that you need to have systems infrastructure classroom uh, 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 systems which are inclusive which can cater to the cwsn it's very imperative with all this we need to have a very robust teacher training modules because you need to train the teachers how to handle a class where Uh, 10% is from economically weaker section 5% is a cwsn 20% is a very bright child who you know who you say a word has understood and 20% is a above average uh, level so you know that kind of a training a robust teacher training module aligning the curriculum where the learning outcomes are achieved where they are able to handle those cwsn where they are able to do those remedial for those who haven't followed and then creating a rubrics for assessment with all this how do you assess the learning because at the end of it when we talk about a uh, a transaction in a classroom when we talk about content delivery we need to have certain system sets set for assessment so i feel that um, uh, in implementing nep these are going to be certain challenges for certain type of institutions yeah there are many who are going to overcome it there are many who will have the you know affordability space uh, management and system which will help them and give them all kind of benefit and support but there 
as i said my first statement that india is a classroom we need to look holistically across yeah. our yeah. nation that how it is going to be implemented so according to me i could think of these as some of the roadblocks because there are schools who don't have facilities for cwsn there are children who don't have gadgets they 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 are not aware of what's happening in these online classrooms hmm. uh there are children who are not been able to attend class classes because of financial issues or because of social emotional reasons there are teachers who don't yeah. know how to implement technology how or how to use tech tools yes most of us have learned but how to make it more engaging more interesting you know so the lot of teacher training that has to be given to our uh, teachers uh, vis a vis nep and the implementation of n um, there is a huge lot of teachers training which is required because the you know the way forward is uh, through the teachers now if we want engaging classrooms and uh, if we want uh, engaged children if we want creative children thought provoking children you know and then the experience to become experiential learning then of course hand holding has to be of the teachers now when we talk about the understanding of teachers about the classroom scenario or about the students you know what i have come across is that uh, teachers uh, do lag behind a little mm, maybe we some of us uh, principals maybe it's our role i we do understand but then with so many other things to look at uh, teacher training at times take takes a back seat here at this point in time i think that we, we must take up teachers training as the first and the most important task at hand because um, many a time i've seen teachers not understanding the basic needs uh, of the classroom Uh, engagement or the classroom management uh, like ma'am was saying different kinds of children it's like the classroom is like a bouquet isn't it so uh, and if we do not know the different kinds of flowers and uh, the their specialities or their features then how would we arrange it uh, to the best uh, uh, of uh, you know aesthetics that can't happen so i have seen that uh, you know when it comes to the basic uh, 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 understanding of things like multiple intelligence of bloom's taxonomy of you know the basic thing like learning style if a child is how a child is learning what kind of um, attitude and value does the child have so such kind of basic understanding also at times lacks in children uh, in teachers and one more thing which um, bothers me a little bit is Mm, the slight lack of empathetic attitude in them that may be because of the uh, fact that uh, teachers themselves are going through a lot these days uh, but then it is not only these last two years that i refer to it has been uh, for a long time that i have been observing uh, they somehow uh, miss this uh, mm, you know feature of being able to put themselves in such a scenario at least we can go back to our own classroom days and think about how we could uh, would have felt had this been happening to us and obviously inclusivity is one big issue um, we fail to include people in our lives it is an issue that we need to take up very seriously and at the earliest because <laughs> inclusivity is not only about uh, you know being physically Uh, in physical need of help or something it is also emotional reaching out it is also about uh, just being able to understand and be understood as simple as that you know so uh, there are uh, needs on the part of the teachers as well of course but then that will only happen if there is open communication effective open communication that is also a very important thing that we should look at So what is your take on NEP's promoting multilingualism and upholding linguistic diversity? Children know better when they are any kind of you know uh, knowledge or skill or disposition is being taught in their own way. Right. So the concept of three language or the uh, regional language as a medium of instruction is one of the most demanding 
area in education and which has been really addressed well by the government in NEP 2020. Uh, so this will certainly go to, you know, enhance their basic knowledge, right? Two, I also appreciate the work first time which the government of India has done, that integration of the, you know, uh, uh, early age, right? When the child was there, is there in, you know, a pre-education or pre-schooling, that is also being integrated in the school education system with the concept of, you know, uh, mother language as a medium of instruction. So, I'm very much sure that in coming year, you will find that if the NEP with the concept of multilingualism is being implemented, the learning gap which we find in the later stage, especially uh, uh, I, I would like to refer one of the NAS data, that is National Sample Survey data, Achievement Survey data, that 36% of the children in India has completed their uh, upper middle school and not able to read, write and comprehend any particular language. That is a major learning gap. Look, if you are going to teach any child in any specific language where he is not familiar with, so the child is supposed to learn the language first. Uh, and if the child is being taught in the sub language, which is being, you know, uh, he or she is going to start from the, you know, household, that is really going to change the entire picture. So that will multilingualism will not only solve the problem of, you know, mitigating the learning expectancy or whatsoever that we have expected from the child, but it will also serve the uh, scientific way to serve the, you know, human neurons to grasp the thing easily. So I think this is a very welcome, you know, approach which has been introduced by the government. But the point is the major drawback, which I feel that in India, there are very specific language, uh, you know, uh, where the instructional textbook are available, a quality instructional textbook are available. So though the step is good, but you know, it's all about implementation and I feel uh, in India, many times we do a great job, but the real implementation sometimes lacks and which create, a, you know, the same situation or the end of the same story. I'm sure this time the way government of India is leading the program in any domain of education sector I, after NEP 2020, it is going to achieve and create something major, uh, you know, very positive uh, differences in education system. We have been using this term inclusivity a lot, right? For me, inclusivity of language is very, very important. Now, when it, when we are talking about uh, uh, the languages, you know, we are all, most of us here, sitting here, are uh, we, we all belong to English medium schools, you know, and that automatically, you know, shifts our inclination towards the uh, language English. But unfortunately, what happens is that um, most of our students are weaker in Hindi than in English, it being their mother tongue, you know, and uh, they are not upset about it. What makes me upset about this situation is that they are not upset about not knowing their own language, not having a command of on their own language and feeling happy that they are better in somebody else's language than they are about their own. For example, a teacher or a, a, a mother teacher, a teacher who's a mother that is, uh, feels very happy that the child responds better in English and speaks better in English than in Hindi and is not able to participate in a Hindi assembly. She's not unhappy about it. And the same thing, if she, she may, she'll be very unhappy if the child is not able to speak English and is not part of the assembly. This is not right, I guess. You know, we ours is you know our country is known for the unity and diversity and diversity of languages has to be taken into account there are such beautiful languages inclusivity of different accents different languages different uh, you know flavors of language the dialects i mean all of this has to be accepted because at the end of the day what is education education mostly is dependent on understanding what is being taught in the classroom if the transaction is happened properly if whatever is given is being taken 
then only it makes sense i keep on giving but there is no taker it's all wasted then there is no point i guess so the communication as i said is very very important but the communication has to happen in a language which is acceptable to the taker right so there is uh, uh, the problem is um, uh, one language we are uh, heading towards but the other languages are lagging behind and we are not sorry about it we come from a certain state or a certain region and we are very uh, all, almost okay with not being able to speak that language pick up that accent and that means we are losing our own touch so uh, where are we heading these are things which should be, uh, which will be addressed hopefully when this uh, uh, nep will be implemented because uh, uh, if we are allowed to have uh, these multilingualism and we will have we will accommodate a lot many more languages in the system then obviously uh, inclusivity at its best i guess uh, of people of um, you know uh, cultures of languages of everything india is a multilingual uh, country so we cannot uh, accommodate all the languages in one single classroom so bilingual is still manageable and uh, yes it will uh, give up the positive part of this is yes if we teach a child in their pre uh, initial years if we teach them in hindi more yeah. right they understand it in much better way because hum ghar pe bhi unse hindi mein hi baat kar rahe hote it's not a international country where we are yeah. speaking in english to a small child at home so that that gives okay but agar hum har kisi ka baat kare if we talk about that every child suppose i have a child from uh, bengali family but like onika ma'am has already said this but i just want to uh, say a few points on this that yes if we have say 10 different language people in one Correct. class Correct. how can a single teacher will teach all the kids in that particular class Correct. so bilingual is still okay but multilingual is not possible not possible yes. said that home is the first school and the child learns the best when he or she is taught in the mother tongue but when it comes to school we can't have a mix uh, i mean we have a mix lot where somebody's mother tongue is punjabi somebody's mother tongue is bengali so a teacher cannot teach in the mother tongue a teacher or a school has to adopt as a one medium of instruction now this is we can say bilingual for delhi uh, punjab haryana but when you move down south when i'm doing workshops for teachers in south in bangalore in hyderabad i mean it's not possible for me to speak in hindi because half of them don't even understand hindi so what are we talking of bilingual then we have to have our conversation our dissemination of our statements totally in english so then there the bilingual comes as english and kannada english or telugu mm. because there they will learn better in that particular manner because that's their mother tongue <coughs> but when it comes to states like delhi haryana punjab and mp where mostly the mother tongue is hindi or if it is punjabi or if it is xyz anything there a teacher has Uh, a little freedom to speak in yes. english or hindi to the early years or to the primary years but as i said home is the first school and parents are the first teachers so a child will learn the best in the mother tongue and that's the responsibility of the parent and there again comes the home school partnership Uh, given the last statement and a final message to all the parents and all the viewers who will be <coughs> watching the session out there uh, the point is education is all about development i was uh, very eagerly listening with all the people and you know this is the beauty in education system that every people define the truth in their own way the most important uh, oh, you know objective of the education is that the child should grow and you know prepare himself for the future to serve the mankind right and contribute something to the society in any way if education is going to achieve and fulfill that particular you know aspiration let's embrace it and welcome it i hope with the contribution of all the eminent you know educationists we will march on and certainly uh, we will raise our bar in the global way and we can also serve to the whole human society in the world 
so my final take for all the teachers parents and my dear students is three words what we need to do is we need to mobilize we need to stabilize and we need to strategize <coughs> when we talk about mobilizing we mean that we need to have equitable access to all resources we have to streamline systems that is what we understand by mobilizing when we say we have to stabilize which means we need to build the capacity of our students and teacher we have to take feedbacks respond to those feedbacks encourage and motivate a lot of collaboration and communication that is what stabilizing is and when we say we have to strategize i mean to say that we need to strategize our learning systems they have to be more peer learning it has to be more focused on research and development we have to rethink on the role of a teacher we need to rethink as mr anand rightly said the teacher is now going to be a facilitator so the role of a teacher has to be re i mean thought of it it has to be strategized and we need to have a lot of team building amongst our teaching community Uh, my uh, word to the parents would be be honest with your children because they have never seen this pandemic i don't want the scar in the mind to remain there allow us to be honest answer them question and allow evolve the children from what to think uh, to how to think you know so this is the lead the parents should um, give the children don't make them think think it's the children evolve them as to what how they have to think oh, whether by Uh, uh you know accident or by, through planning you, you have come uh, to the teaching profession or in the education industry uh, which, whichever way it is uh, i think one needs to understand the role properly and to de to deliver it one has to um you know strategize as to what is expected of it be a facilitator or be a uh, you know a friend or a philosopher or a guide whatever it is you know one has to understand that they are dealing with the most precious resource in the world and it, whatever we are going to uh, you know what the kind of society that we are going to live in let's say 10 years or 20 years hence we are des designing it now so let's design it well so what i would like to say is that uh, new education policy will transform the youth of tomorrow by inculcating the different different uh, skills in them such as uh, life skills creative skills emotional skills etc and from we will be sooner than working from growth learning to the experiential learning which will be very important and will, which will bring the change in the nation i think as parents and as people as consuming education so to say i think we really ha uh, have to be impressed by what the teachers and school leaders did in this pandemic um I'm so impressed if I hear the stories of how they scaled up education and moved it online very very quickly so that is just a big thanks and shout out to everyone who did that. I also want to say that NAP is really putting in place a structure uh, to develop and discover everyone's talents uh, more so than the road memorization of before NAP did but it's still up to you as a parent and as a child to really grab onto that and develop your talents in school out school wherever that is uh, and now that the pandemic is over i hope a lot of opportunities for that are opening up so keep learning and keep developing